Good morning. Welcome to the Future Heroes program, workshop number five, which today is devoted to design thinking. Number five means that we are already halfway through the program. And the first half has, I believe, been quite tough, but at the same time rewarding with lots of learning, development, and collab collaboration going on. We've met really professional, inspiring, and successful people and role models, and you girls have been fantastic. So I wish us all even more energy, more joy, and personal development also in the second part of the program. Today, for the inspirational part of the workshop, I would like to present former politician, international consultant, and visit visiting lecturer at the Stuco Stockholm School of Economics in Riga, and grade school of law, Lolita Chigane. Welcome, Lolita. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, dear participants. Um, I will take a minute to share my screen. And um, <clears throat> I'm very happy to participate in this program uh, because I really believe in um, motivation and power of girls. And I believe that girls can and that girls really need inspiration and need good stories to be able to follow, to be able to fulfill their life goals and life wishes. So I have called my presentation, Girls, You Can. And how do I know that you can? Because I am a girl just like you. I used to be a girl just like you. Today, of course, I have uh, much more uh, experience and many more years. And this is probably the only thing that separates me from who you are today and who I am today. And who I am today, I will just uh, briefly tell you. And also I will briefly tell you how I got uh, where I am today in my life. And also the many challenges and the many lessons I had to overcome uh, to get to this point. So in general, uh, this photo, as you will see, shows that uh, currently we are all in the same situation. We are all suffering from the pandemic. Uh, we all hoped that we would have a chance to meet in person, uh, to share the group energy, but it didn't happen. Because of the pandemic, we do have to wear masks and we have to be happy for every interaction that we can have. And this is really fantastic that we have these technological means to interact and to speak to each other. So in general, um, every one of us has some roles and some stories that we can tell about ourselves. So if I'm telling my professional uh, story, I am usually mentioning that I was the chair of the uh, anti-corruption organization, international uh, anti-corruption organization in Latvia from 2008 to 2010. I was a journalist of Radio Free Europe, uh, which was a, a free uh, radio uh, station that was uh, initially trying to tell uh, the truth uh, without propaganda to the societies of the uh, Soviet Union and afterwards uh, was trying to show how to conduct good journalism uh, to uh, the developing societies of our region. I have a Master of Arts degree in International Relations and European Studies from Central European University in Budapest. I have studied in London. I studied political and economy of transition in London School of Economics. I have also worked as a civil society advocate for less corruption in our political party financing, both in Latvia and also internationally. I was a member of parliament for eight years from 2010 to 2018. I was chairing the European Affairs Committee of the Latvian parliament from 2014 to 2018, including when Latvia had the presidency of the European Union, a very big event in uh, every uh, country's uh, history, uh, which is a member of the European Union. And currently I work as international consultant and also lecturer in Stockholm School of Economics and Riga Graduate School of Law. So this is what I tell about myself professionally. And this is how people know me when they are thinking about my professional 
past. However, I'm also a mother. I have uh, twin sons. They are 17 and a half, and they are living through uh, this uh, very tough age, I would say, uh, tough age of growing up during the times of pandemic. And this really makes me more aware and more understanding of the challenges that young people are facing these days. And what is also important, it actually keeps me focused on the way how I myself grew up, what challenges I had to overcome, the fact that it was not always simple, the fact that I was not always motivated and always knowing what I am supposed to do. And this is ex exactly the times you are having now. Probably many of you are confused. Many of you feel that this uh, working uh, from home is very difficult. It's really hard to get your uh, motivation going. And besides that, it's very difficult to understand what the world will be like once we emerge from this pandemic. These are all questions that are just so natural to your uh, age and to your growing up. And my sons have been my best teachers to really always keep that perspective in mind in terms of where I came from, what took me to succeed and to do the things that I really enjoy, and what the uh, future has for us. So in general, all of us can have can tell an alternative story, a different story to all those nice professional things that we are usually uh, telling about when we are presenting ourselves professionally. And this is where we come from. If we are talking about the confusing times that you are having now, I have to say that my growing up was fairly confusing too. I actually was born in the Soviet times. Uh, I was born in a village where all houses were similar. We all had similar furniture at home. We all dressed similarly because it was very difficult to get anything that you could stand out with. We all walked to the same village school. All the same events happened. And somehow people very well knew what they should be speaking and what they shouldn't be speaking. Too much interest in politics, too much analysis of current events, events too much thinking of what your uh, teachers were telling you was not encouraged in my childhood. So a lot of people got uh, their uh, expression and their professional hopes connected to such things as singing and music. I did have very high hopes for my ability to at some point uh, be a good singer in a girls choir and later on probably in something that is more uh, serious, but it didn't fulfill itself. I just did not have the singing voice. And I did not have the perfect hearing that was required to be able to be a star of the girls' choir. So I was rejected. For me, it was a non go I then hoped that I would be a good dancer. Every girl at that time wanted to dance in some folk group. And there also, it was a disappointment. I wasn't a good dancer. I could not coordinate my movements. I could not coordinate my movements to the music. And I just didn't succeed there. So it was quite unfortunate. At the time when my friends uh, from the village could go on singing and dancing tours, I didn't have much to do because I couldn't join those groups. And then at some point, I found a friend. She was a wonderful girl. She was much freer compared to all of us because today we would say that she was coming from a socially unprivileged or socially uh, decried family. Her family constantly moved places, she changed schools, and she was not fitting in this overall frame of the Soviet thinking of what good school pupils are. And I loved her. She was such a great friend. And we had a wonderful summer together. Well, my all proper friends uh, uh, who, who were properly fitting in the uh, school dance and uh, singing culture uh, were doing uh, their concerts and doing the serious business. I was just fooling around with this friend of mine. And what it turned out when I started my fifth grade, uh, this friend of mine and I, we had picked up lice. These are small insects uh, that live in people's uh, hair. And what happened uh, when I started my fifth grade, uh, my class teacher, she was not awfully impressed with my behavior. And she actually told everyone in my class 
that I was the only person who had lice in the uh, in, in in our uh, in our uh, uh, class. And of course, you know what kids are like. Very quickly, the whole thing spread to the whole school, and the whole school knew that I am the girl who has the lice in her hair. My friend had left to a different school, so for her it wasn't a burden. I was just the only one who was pointed out always. And then for the whole year, I was living through this experience of being the different one, the ugly one, the stinky one, whom no one wanted to be friends with. And this is just how, happen how it happens. Kids are cruel. And I have to say, I've been cruel to other kids, and this was the time when kids were cruel to me. It was a long, long time of suffering. And when I was hoping that it would end in the next year, when I started my uh, uh, sixth grade, it turned out that my air side had really <clears throat> weakened and I needed to wear glasses. And in the Soviet times, glasses were supposed to be a horrible stigma. It was so ugly. It's not like today when you put on your glasses and look, you look intelligent and stylish. At those times, you were the, the ugly, the clumsy, the unwanted one. So when I had struggled through this uh, uh, first uh, difficult year of my life, the second hit came and I needed to wear glasses. And then I swore to myself, no glasses for me. I'm not gonna put on these ugly Soviet glasses. I will just struggle through. And this was actually what this childhood experience told me. You have to struggle through. If everyone goes straight, if everyone has white arrows, it's not for granted that you will have them too, but you have to move, 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 move. Keep moving, never stop moving. Better times are ahead. This is what I always told uh, myself. And literally during those times, I felt like this little rodent, like this little hedgehog in a tunnel. I knew that all I have to do is just to creep through this and the, 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 the light at the end of the tunnel will come and I will get out of there. The only thing that I need to do is keep moving. If I get stuck, then that's it. So this was uh, very much my uh, childhood experience that very early taught me that the life is like a swing. There are ups and downs. And the only thing that is always guaranteed is if you are up and you are feeling so great and you are completely on the top of the uh, top of uh, your life, the downturn is just awaiting you because this is how life goes. But the encouraging thing is that if you faced your hit and you've fallen, the upturn is just next to you. And all you have to do is just to be patient and keep moving. So this is how I perceived my life early on. Through those smaller or bigger traumas, we all have our hits. We all have our traumas. Some of us are immediately talented in the things that they want to do. And for some of us, these talents and abilities, they show up later. And very often it happens so that it's like a hidden tre treasure. Once you find them, you are just so happy and satisfied to be able to develop them. So what have been my tools for getting through those tough times? It is not so that always a uh, hedgehog just moving on really succeeds. What has been very important for myself is always remind myself that I have to learn something new and that the only way how I can learn something new, enhance my capabilities, be able to move ahead is hard work. There is nothing that replaces hard work. The more you work, the better results you have. The more you develop yourself, your abilities, the better results it delivers. And working hard is really very rewarding. If initially it sounds tough and boring, after some time you see the results and it all of a sudden all falls into, into its own places and you feel that somehow the world is unraveling. It's like uh, doing a big puzzle, which has many, many pieces. Initially, you are just so confused. It's very difficult to understand where to start from. But if you really put in the hard work, 
you start putting the pieces together, you start seeing where the sky is, where the ground is, where the buildings are, and all picture all of a sudden it unravels in front of your eyes and you know exactly what you are supposed to be doing. Another thing is that you shouldn't be afraid of your tears. Very often, hard work does not bring immediate uh, benefits. And sometimes you will have to cry. And throughout my career, throughout my childhood that I described, throughout every stage of my life, I really have had to cry bitter tears. But I have always understood that this is a time which I have to endure and better times are out there, just like in that swing. And do not be afraid of your tears. It's just part of our natural, uh, natural uh, growing up. There is nothing to be ashamed of. All of us, all of us get desperate. All of us lose confidence. Even the most successful women that you will be seeing on the world stage, Michelle Obama, for instance, has written in her memoir about the big times of setbacks and loss of confidence. And th those times are inevitable. They hit us all and we just cry. However, one thing that has always kept me going when I have these loss of faith, loss of confidence, is just staying open. To staying open to whatever comes. To always keep my eyes and ears attuned to the signals that are coming to me. And maybe very often in the deepest of desperation, in the deepest loss of confidence, all of a sudden you get the signal. You are fine and there is the way out. If your eyes are closed, if your, uh, if your eyes are closed, if your ears are closed, you're not gonna hear it, but it's always there. And for that reason, we need to stay open and also have a bit of luck and hope. And that's always there for us. So just talking about the way of how to go through the difficult times, how to get through the difficult times and how to always see opportunities. Every time when you get stuck, every time when you feel humiliated, like I felt humiliated in the fifth grade when everyone was laughing at me, or I was so ashamed of wearing these ugly big Soviet glasses. So I really had to pretend that I was ill when I knew there would be a test in math, for instance, and there would be a lot of things written on the blackboard and I wouldn't be able to read them. So I was faking that I was sick and always trying to stay at home and then trying to improve my math grades by doing lots and lots of hard, hard uh, homework. So how do you keep track? How do you see the big picture? The big picture, you are in that tunnel, you are that rodent or that hedgehog, and you just have to keep moving on. But what gives you the motivation to keep moving on? And that is the big picture. The fact that you are attending these classes, girls, it means that you have courage more than fear, that you've actually been able to overcome fear. And what is fear? Fear is something we experience when we are faced with something that is unknown, where we need to take initiative. We don't know which way it will go. And there is a potential of failure. That is fear and it's holding us back. However, once your courage your ability to be courageous and take initiative wins over your fear, then you have this possibility to move on. So I am always asking myself, am I more curious or more afraid? And you have to admit, you are afraid. It's normal to be afraid. People are afraid, are afraid of the unknown. They are very uh, uh, often afraid of the fact uh, that they will be exposed, that they will not be competent enough, that there might be a situation where they have nothing to say, where they will say silly things. We are all human beings. We are afraid of those things. But it's always very important to ask, am I more curious or more afraid? And you have already responded to this question. You are more curious than afraid. 
And this is how you overcome your fear. You have to try. And one thing leads to the next one, and you will not find it out whether this one thing leads to the next one if you do not try. It's like a ladder. If you don't take the first step, you have no chance to be on the last step. So you have to take courage and take the first step because the first step will most likely lead to the last, uh, to the last step. And even if it doesn't, you've at least tried. It's always worth to try. And this is just a small personal story uh, from my own life. Uh, when I was uh, 22 years old, my friend uh, said that she had found a language school uh, in London uh, that teaches languages and allows students uh, to work on part-time basis in London. Uh, we scraped together the funds. It was early 90s and it was very difficult to get the money to get there. Uh, part of our journey we covered by hitchhiking. And we, when we got uh, to the uh, United Kingdom, it turned out uh, that all the picture was not that rosy and it was actually a lot of struggle with very, very little means. However, my friend and I, we struggled through the summer. We returned back. We seriously improved our English abilities. We had gained in self-confidence because we had actually been able to struggle through those months of summer. And after about seven years, I received a very good scholarship at that same city uh, in London, at the London School of Economics, that really helped me to a large extent define my future career. And I really felt that without this young girl of 22 uh, years uh, age, without me taking that crazy courageous step of traveling to London, diving into really crazy, uh, crazy challenges. It wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't have been able to study in the school that I so much crave to study at. So the big picture too. What, it, what is very important when you are in that tunnel and you are that hedgehog or that rodent that is trying to get through and get yourself moving, it's always very important to broaden your environment and to always remember that this tunnel is not everything there is to the light. That you need to find out what are the points of confidence, what will give you confidence. And we Latvians, for instance, we are not awfully good at really complimenting other people and boosting others' com uh, confidence. But you have to always remember that you have wings and you have to find a way how to boost your, uh, your self-confidence. And for me, one thing that I learned very early on is what, that it was the studying languages. This beautiful photo is from Norway. I had learned Swedish and I was able to speak uh, the Swedish language, but all of a sudden a group invited me to go with them to Norway uh, to work as a translator. And I said that I'm not able to speak the Norwegian language. And the, um, the, the, the manager of the group said, well, but it's certainly a similar to Norwegian, uh, a language similar to Norwegian. And I said, well, similar enough. I can probably understand 80% uh, of uh, the capital city dialect and 60% of the other. And he told me, well, this is more than any one of us knows. And this is how I went on on this uh, wonderful trip. Similarly, I started learning Spanish uh, when I started studying in Riga. It was a difficult year. Uh, I did not have enough self-confidence to fit in in a university was, uh, which was extremely competitive. But I, had, but I had a wonderful Spanish teacher who really liked me, and specifically because I have a Spanish name. So we developed this bond that actually gave me enough uh, self-confidence to go through the first year. And then when I was in the parliament, I took a year of French classes. Uh, we went to the French uh, Senate, uh, the upper house of the parliament, the atmosphere was good enough, and all of a sudden I felt I could give a speech in French. Francais, oui. And this was the uh, ability to adapt and to speak the language that uh, really made that visit wonderful. And big picture three, 
sometimes we feel that we need to be very rational and calculate everything. We have to calculate every next step and always think what is the best uh, uh, way to, uh, to go. But sometimes it is good just to let go, specifically when you are young. Uh, when you still don't have a family uh, uh, to take care of, when uh, there are not that all those many duties that you have as an adult person. And this is me hitchhiking. I and my classmates, uh, we spent a year in, uh, in uh, Sweden where we studied Swedish and other things, and we hitchhiked. We traveled all across Scandinavia by hitchhiking. And there you have to be just very open to whatever the life tells you. And what I've learned in my life in general is that the world is small and the life is long. So when you are young, there are many people who will help you. And sometimes you forget to thank them and to be grateful to them. And sometimes you uh, realize that your true mentors are someone that you didn't know that they are that. Always thank them in your thoughts and always do some good things to others. Sometimes an immediate loss can turn out to be a big win in the long term. So when you are in that situation where you feel that you've lost something serious, you might actually be on the upper swing. You might actually uh, be on the curve where you will eventually look back at that loss and think about it as a true win. And don't be afraid to sometimes fall. We do need to fall sometimes to realize how good it is to be successful and sometimes just how good our life is. The fact that we are safe, that we live in prosperous and safe country is already a very uh, good thing that frames our lives uh, so that we can have a positive outlook. And another thing that I've learned and that I can share from my perspective is that uh, life is very long and it's always worthwhile uh, to start learning new things. And this is really what I can tell from my life, life experience. As you saw, I was a member of parliament until 2018. And uh, when I ended up my, uh, when I ended my parla uh, parliamentary career, many people asked me, what will you do next? What is your next big career move? And it so happened that because of pandemic and also other conditions, there was not this big job. And I, really learned how to be happy by trying out new things. And for instance, I started working as a volunteer at uh, Riga Women's Prison teaching English. And there I learned that perspectives on the life and what is life success are so dif uh, different. And the fact that those women who were serving their sentences in the prison were really so much waiting for me every week for one hour just to spend the time studying English and forgetting that they are in prison was probably the most important thing I could have done and not the next wonderful career step. And what I also developed was drawing. I started drawing and it turned out that I am quite good at it and it gives me a lot of satisfaction. And so instead of buying big nice presents to my friends, I can give them my drawings. And this is a drawing that you see on the screen that I gave to my friend to whom we traveled together with to London in the beginning of 1990s when we needed a, a lot of courage to be able to struggle through difficult challenges. I do have uh, uh, some videos that I wanted to share with you from my work in, as a member of parliament. And now I have to ask whether we have time to look at them. We do. Okay. Um, as a member of parliament, I was working together uh, with a lot of uh, powerful and forceful men. And uh, they were uh, very self-confident very often. And for a woman to be a politician it's not an easy work, but here, what, I've, uh, what I would like to tell you, that you should never, never, never be intimidated by a boy or a man to wh of whom you think that they are in a much higher position and somehow having much more competence and wisdom. And I will show you three small videos from my experience 
of how to deal with situations like this. This one does not have an English translation. So very briefly, I'm sitting next to the deputy mayor of Riga City, um, uh, of Riga City Council. And we are having a discussion about the waste management in Riga uh, City. Zinit, es dzīvoju Rīgas pilsētas centrā, un es reizēm te jūtos kā pēdējais mohikāns, jo tas centrs ir vienkārši pilns ar mašīnām, tie ir slikts gais, nepatīkama vide, piemēram, tas, kas mums notiek ar atkrituma urnām. Kopš padomu laikiem nav modernizēta atkrituma urnas. Šobrīd mums ir tik daudz ātrās ēdināšanas restorāni, kur cilvēki visu laiku kaut ko met ārā. Mums plūst pāri atkrituma urnas. Mēs dzīvojam turpat, kur mēs dzīvojam 80. gadu beigās ar to atkrituma urnu infrastruktūru. Velosipēdistiem, kas ir daļa sociālajam darbiniekam, kas dzīvo varbūt piecus kvartāls no sava darba, ir daudz lētāk un ērtāk braukt ar velosipēdu. Arī viņa interesēs tas ir. Paskatieties, braucs lielie džipi. So this was when I felt that I needed to speak my mind. Uh, and uh, though I was seated uh, in a uh, discussion format uh, between the deputy mayor of uh, uh, the Riga City Council and another man who was powerful and, uh, and having high position at that time, I felt I needed to speak my mind. And uh, this was um, uh, something that really got this question moving and attracted a lot of attention because no one had spoken to them in similar manner and pointed out the problems that we had with waste management in our capital city. Here is another example of a speech that I made while I was in the parliament. And this um, uh, particular situation made me especially upset because there was a member of parliament who had submitted an amendment to the law that would actually allow our society continue consuming very cheap, very low quality alcohol. And this was just a spontaneous speech, which made an impression. This amendment was finally rejected by the parliament. Let's see. Cienījamie kolēģi, es arī gribētu lūgt jūs neatbalstīt līdakas kunga priekšlikumu, jo šis priekšlikums pēc būtības mazina sākotnējo komisijas apņēmību liekt tirgot alkoholu šajos te ārkārtīgi lielajos iepakojumos. Un stāstīt stāstus un anekdotes no šīs tribīnes, gan, protams, ir citu deputātu paradumi, un es negribu ar viņiem konkurēt, tomēr arī neliels stāsts no manas puses. Šajā vasarā es biju kādā reģionālajā veikalā, kur man priekšā stāvēja vīrs, dižana ražana auguma vīrs, kas bija paņēmis, atlasījis sev divas milzīgas alkohola stiprināt ālus pudeles un grasījās par tā maksāt. Un tādī brīdī, kad vīrs pārdarējai deva naudiņu, veikalā ieskrēja maza noraudājusies meitenīte un teica, tēti, tu atkal izlaupīji manu krēkasīti, lai pirktu sev alkoholu. Līdakas kunga priekšlikums šim kungam ļaus turpināt pirkt liela apjoma alkoholu pudeles. Lūdzu neatbalstiet. And uh, as I said, uh, this was just a spontaneous intervention, but I felt that I re really needed to do something because uh, the, whole, uh, area, uh, the whole row of speakers before me had actually said to what extent passing uh, the law would actually damage uh, the business interests of the producers. Uh, and I felt that I really needed to break uh, this uh, chain of argumentation and really stand up. And I succeeded. And just another example. Again, another colleague, another very clever, very exper experienced colleague, lobbying the interest of a Russian gas company in Latvia. Oops, sorry. Let me go back. Cienījamā saimas priekšsēdētāji, cienījamie kolēģi, ir Ziemassvētku laiks. Mēs šodien pie saimas dekorējām piparkūkas un Ziemassvētku vakarā mēs visi gaidīsim pie mūsu mājām klusi, klusi pielaboties 
Ziemassvētku vecīti. Gaidīsim Ziemassvētku vecīti ar dāvaniņā maisā. Dzerēsim, ka dāvaniņas sildīs un iepriecinās mūsu sirdis. Šāds pats klus, klus vecītis ir pielavījies arī enerģētikas likumam. Tikai šoreiz maisā bija nevis dāvaniņas, kas iepriecinās un sildīs mūsu sirdi, bet šajā maisā bija Gazprom intereses, kuras šeit šī namā ļoti veikli lobē bijušais premjeras kalvītes un citi viņa izpalīgi. Dzīniemie kolēģi, patiesi ir tā, ka klusi, klusi virzītais Mējas kunga likuma grozījums, ko komisija atbalstīja, domājot, ka tas ir pavisam nevainīgs grozījums, pēc būtības radikāli izmaina to koncepciju, kādā valdība bija iecerējusi sadalīt Latvijas gāzi. Sākumā valdība bija iecerējusi sadalīt Latvijas gāzi divos atsevišķos uzņēmumos ar nošķirtām īpašumtiesībām un nošķirtu juridisko formu. Vienā uzņēmumā būtu uzglabāšana un pārvada. Uzglabāšana ir īpaši svarīga, jo šeit ir mūsu strateģiskais aktīvs Inčukalna gāzes krātuma. Otrā nošķirtajā uzņēmumā būtu sadala un tirzniecība. Bet Mējas kungs šobrīd ar savu priekšlikumu ir klusiņām, klusiņām ievilinājis iespēju uzglabāšanu un pārvadi nolikt kā mazu kastīti, kā meitas uzņēmumu sadalē un tirzniecībā, nenošķirot īpašumu tiesības. Un ja mēs paskatāmies uz īpašumu tiesību struktūru Latvijas gāzē, mēs redzam, ka 34% tajā piedara Gazpromam, tā tad Krievijas gāzes monopolistam, un 16% Itarai, kas kā pilsētā runā ir tas pats. Dzienījumie kolēģi šādā veidā, So here you see that, uh, of course, it wasn't a spontaneous reaction. I really prepared. I prepared well for um, defeating this uh, amendment. And I really analyzed uh, the situation with the energy market, with the gas supply, uh, with what the amendment would mean. And here, I just wanted to show you that there are no typical issues that girls would work with and that boys would work with. If you are interested in public good and you are interested in good policy and good governance, even as a girl, you can actually handle the toughest questions. And this amendment that was uh, submitted by the colleague uh, who had achieved its support in the committee was rejected by the plenary because I had studied, I had prepared and was able to convince colleagues that they shouldn't be voting for it. So in sum, I would like to tell you that when I was four years old and went to the kindergarten, I thought that I would be a singer in a girls choir, in a beautiful academic choir, I would be a singer or a dancer in a folk group, maybe ballet dancer or so. But it turned out differently. It turned out differently. And I'm so happy that I have had an ability to let the life flow, to take me to places and to always move, move and move. And this is what I wish you girls too. Girls, you can. Thank you so much.